So good evening, everyone. Uh, good afternoon for those of you in Israel and good morning for uh, our audience in Brazil or elsewhere. Um, my name is Alex Bahar Fuchs and I am a senior research fellow and neuropsychologist in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Melbourne. I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to the second webinar in a series that my colleague Marcelo Magidman and I from the board of the Australian Friends of the University of Tel Aviv have the pleasure of organizing for the broader community. In March, we went off to a fantastic start with an excellent uh, presentation by professors Uri Sherry and Sylvia Cotton from Tel Aviv University who discussed new frontiers in aging in an event that was moderated by Professor Ashley Bush from the Florey Institute here in Melbourne. Today, we're in for uh, another fantastic treat, and I'm personally super excited at the opportunity to welcome a very special guest and my old friend, Dan Amiram. I have known Dan for around 30 years. It's not every day that I get to say that I know somebody for this long, as we grew up in the same neighborhood in Beersheba and went together to the McKeith Gimel High School, the renowned McKeith Gimel High School. When Dan and I reconnected some 10 years ago um, at a visit I made to New York, during which I learned that Dan was uh, now faculty member at Columbia University, I was anything but surprised. Ever since studying with Dan for our very first exam in year nine at high school, I have known that Dan was amongst the smartest guys I have ever met. But just as much as his superb intellectual abilities were a great asset, it was Dan's famously friendly, bubbly, generous, inclusive, and, and curious style that undoubtedly helped him open the many, many doors that he opened over the years. In the past 10 years since, Dan has clearly returned to Israel, uh, indeed I hear to Beersheba, and clearly continued uh, going from strength to strength, and is now full professor and vice dean at the Kohler School of Management at Tel Aviv University. I was super delighted when Dan immediately accepted my invitation to give this talk to our community, at such a short notice and given his, I'm sure, super busy schedule. Dan chose to talk to us today about financial evolution, technology, and the future of the uh, banking sector, a topic that, like aging, is relevant to just about each and every one of us. And I hope that, uh, like me, uh, you're just as interested in, in I, as I am in hearing Dan's insights on these topics. We're also very, very lucky to have another very special guest to moderate Dan's talk and Q&A that will undoubtedly follow. And it's now my pleasure to invite my colleague and co-organizer of this talk, uh, Dr. Marcelo Magidman from Monash University to introduce him. But before I do that, I'd like to very quickly uh, take the opportunity to thank um, all the members of the Australian Friends of University of Tel Aviv board here in Melbourne for supporting this initiative. And in particular, our president, Rosie Potasnik and marketing manager, Renes Spangin, as well as uh, Gil Rosner, our liaison person in Tel Aviv uh, for assisting with all the logistics. So, Thank you and over to you, Marcelo. Thanks, Alex, and good evening, uh, everyone. I'm Marcelo Magidman, one of the members of AFTAL as well. Uh, and I'm a lecturer and researcher at, in the Department of Social Work at Monash University. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Ilan Goldfein, our moderator for tonight's webinar. Ilan is chairman of the board of Credit Suisse Brazil since September 2019, founding partner and director of CDPP, Brazilian think tank on public policy. He was governor of the Central Bank of Brazil from 2016 until 2019. And in 2018, he was elected Central Banker of the Year by the Banker magazine. He holds a PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Previously in his career, he was a partner, chief economist and advisory to the board of Itaú Unibanco, one of the major banks in, in Brazil. Also, he was founding partner of Ciano Investments and partner of Gavia Investments. Earlier, Ilan worked at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C., Throughout his career, he held academic positions such as professor at Pontifical Catholic University in Brazil and also at Brandeis University in the US, as well as published several papers, books and articles. Finally, Ilan has been elected to the Board of Governors of Tel Aviv University in 2020 and is a former member of the Brazilian Friends of Tel Aviv University where we met and we, I had the great pleasure working alongside Ilan 
Ilan, thanks for being with us in this very early and probably cold morning there in Sao Paulo. Welcome, Baruch Abba, Benvindo. I will leave the floor now for you to lead the webinar and the discussions with Professor Amiran. Thank you so much. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you, Marcelo. Thank you all. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and especially pleasure to moderate uh, a session with Professor Dan Amiram. Uh, it's uh, uh, an exciting and very interesting topic, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you all will be very glad to, to hear. So we're gonna start with Professor uh, Dan making a presentation, and then you all can participate, asking questions, there's a Q&A bottoms where you can ask uh, the questions and I'm just gonna be uh, your moderator, just choosing the questions. If you don't find uh, any questions, I'm gonna make the questions because for me, this is just a fascinating topic. So Dan, thank you very much for doing this. Marcel, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And Alex, thank you very much for organizing too. So thank you, thank you, Ilan. And uh, before you joined the conversation, I was actually uh, telling Alex and Marcelo that you know we could easily switch because you understand uh, this topic as much as I do, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So thank you, Ilan, for for uh, for joining us on that. And uh, you know, I promised Alex not to embarrass him, but I will do that anyway. Uh, Alex is an inspiration to me; he always was. Um, so. Uh, the Israeli education system has its flaws, and Alex was one of them. Uh, and uh, Alex uh, struggled through high school uh, in, in many ways because the Israeli system just couldn't understand how brilliant this guy is. And since then, I've been following his career, and I'm uh, seriously, Alex, I mean, you're, you're an inspiration. Thank you. And, and I also think I also want to take the, this opportunity to thank the American uh, the Australian Friends of Tel Aviv University for your continuous support of the university. We feel that you're part of us, and this is really exciting to be able to come and talk to you. And, and I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, so let me just share my screen and presentation, uh, so we'll be able to look at the same thing. So, so let me start, as, as I was saying, you know, I'm, uh, it's, it's a half Brazilian conversation because uh, in addition to Elan, I'm, uh, uh, I'm the Joseph Safra Chair Professor for Capital wow. Markets and Financial Institution. And uh, those of you who don't know, Joseph Safra is a huge name in uh, the Brazilian banking system. Elan, I'm sure you knew, uh, you knew Joseph. And, and, and so uh, I was fortunate enough to be endowed by his uh, generosity. And um, I'm also heading the Henry Crown Institute of Business, but uh, most, of, most of the time what I'm doing is actually running the business school. Um, so just before I start, so I'll tell you a few things about the business school. The business school, uh, the College School of Management has around 400 employees overall, so it's a pretty large business school. 100 of them are around 100 are full-time uh, uh, faculty members, so professors, uh, assistant professors, and other uh, senior faculty. Um, 300 uh, other staff are around the operation of the school, and this is part of my responsibility. And uh, we're the oldest uh, faculty of management in Israel, the largest by far, and uh, it's pretty uh, it's it's pretty exciting to be part of, of what we plan to do. And we actually, you know, I don't know if you many of you know that, but uh, last week uh, the Council of Higher Education in Israel actually let us approve our uh, online MBA program. So now you can actually be in Australia and take an online MBA, fully online MBA in, uh, in Tel Aviv. So this is a pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting news and pretty big, uh, pretty big for us. Uh, before I start with, uh, with the topic today, which is financial evolution, technology and the future of the banking sector, I would like to, to start with a full disclosure. Uh, so I sit on the board of directors of an Israeli bank. I sit on the board of directors of an Israeli insurtech. 
Uh, I'm all, I also founded a financial technology corporation in uh, when I was in New York, and then this corporation moved to London, and now it sits in Barcelona. But in any case, you know, when we talk about financial evolution, I really don't know who to cheer for, right? Whether I should cheer for the older old institutions or whether I should cheer for for the fintechs, it's kind of complicated to me. But um, you know, we'll uh, as long as you know that I'm involved with all of this in practice, in addition to research, that's that's the main thing I wanted to let you know. So what we're going to try to figure out together today is try to understand how the financial evolution of financial institute, or how the evolution of financial institutions is occurring uh, around the world in the last 10 or so years and what are uh, my prediction about how it's going to move forward. Um, I, I must admit when I presented the first time, I asked the CEO, a bank CEO, uh, what he thinks about this topic. And he told me, you know, that's easy. Just tell everyone that banks are going to get extinct and leave. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm a professor. So if anyone lets me, give, gives me uh, 30 minutes to talk, I can talk for like 24 hours. So that's, uh, that, that's what I do. Uh, you know, put the question differently. What we're trying to understand is whether banks are more like these and they're going to start disappearing from the world as we're going to move forward with time, or they're more like uh, cockroaches. And, and I'm, I'm really not trying to insult, I'm a banker, I'm really trying not to insult bankers here. It's actually a compliment to bankers that they're like cockroaches in this, uh, in this context. What I'm not sure is whether the cockroaches are going to be insulted if I compare them to, to bankers, but you know, that's a different, that, that, that's a different, uh, different question. Um, so before, before uh, we start really digging deep into, into this uh, idea of financial evolution, um, I want to take, because I'm not sure what's the background of the people in this talk, I want to explain what banks are and why, why I'm starting, you know, when I'm talking about financial evolution, why I'm starting uh, from banks. So banks are essentially central to, uh, to they are the central piece to the financial system. But we, just to simplify it, what it, we need to understand what banks do. So I'm going to do it, to explain it very simply. Uh, so sorry, Elon, for, for really make it sim make, making it simple because I really want people to understand. Banks are more complicated than what I'm going to tell, but in, like, in, in their core, banks are simple institutions because what they do is pretty simple. They take deposits from depositors. They take this and invest them as in the forms of loans to, uh, uh, to borrowers. So essentially this is what banks do, right? It doesn't sound complicated, but it is extremely complicated in reality. But for our purposes, that's, that's a simple way to think about banks. So they take deposits and invest them in the forms of loans to, uh, to borrowers. So what do banks need to be good at? So banks need to kind of to figure out and they need to be very good at trying to understand how to invest, okay? So they take deposits and they need to understand whether the people that they're going to give the loans to are going to give the money back, okay? That's, that's in, in its core what banks really need, uh, need to do. In, in more uh, accurate terms, they need to understand what is the probability of default. So what is the chances that the business or individuals that the banks gave money to is going to default. And if this individual or business are going to default, what's going to be their loss? So it's called LGD or loss given default. Okay, so this is what they're uh, trying to do. And essentially in a simple way, they just need to charge more, just a bit more than what they're going to lose, right? So if you lose your expected loss of the bank from lending is 3%, if they take 5% a year, so they make money. So that's essentially the, the business behind, uh, behind banks. Give higher rate than what you're paying and you're, you're good. So there, there is a long research uh, along those lines uh, over the years, some of mine, but mostly not mine, that tries to understand the importance of banks and what we know right now is that there is a causal relation, a causal, it's not association, a causal relation 
between the development of the banking sector in a country to its financial to, to its growth, to its economic growth. Okay, I'll, I'll explain it in an example soon. But we know that countries with better banks are growing faster. Okay, that's kind of like the, the most probably the most important uh, finding in this uh, literature that tries to explain the relation or the importance of, of banks. And you know, if if we had some doubt about whether banks are important, we saw what happened around the world in 2008 when banks essentially stopped working. So when banks stopped working, when banks stopped working, it's called either credit crunch, credit freeze, financial crisis. There are different words for what, how we call it when it happens. Those are the worst crises that the countries can have. This is, those are the crises where people actually jump off roofs. Okay? And we saw in 2008 when the bank, the US banking sector stopped working, what happened? So what we know is that banking, banks are important. They're important for growth. When they stop working, it's a nightmare. Okay? And I'm sure that Elon spent a lot of his career trying to figure out how to make sure it doesn't happen. And, but, but why? The question is, why are they important? So we know they're important, but why are they important? And the reason that financial economists like, like me have tried to figure it out is why banks are so special. And I think there, there are several answers to that, but I think the main one is that banks are very good as information intermediaries. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a weird word, but think about it like that. Banks know to look for information that help them to assess the quality of the borrowers. Okay, that's what they're good at. And no other organization is as good as them in doing that, okay? So banks are special because they can gather information efficiently and they can use it efficiently. But let's, you know, let's simplify it and let's make it as an example. Let's assume we have this guy that is named Joe, okay? So Joe uh, um, has this idea for a business, okay? His business is to make widgets. And for the business to make widgets, it needs Joe needs to purchase a, a machine for let's say 1,000 uh, 1, Australian dollars, okay? So for 1,000 Australian dollars, Joe can buy uh, uh, this widget making machine and he can, sell the, he can sell the widget for 1,200 Australian dollars. So there is 200 profit here. But Joe only has 500 Australian dollars. So he needs extra $500 to buy the machine. And the machine is pretty good, right? Because it will gain 1,200 and everyone needs this widget. So how will Joe fund this? Well, someone needs to fund it for Joe, the extra 500. And what we found out is that banks are the most efficient in doing that. Why? Because they will be able to go to Joe, figure out exactly what this machine is doing, take the machine as a collateral. And all those operations that banks do are essentially allowing this growth because take this Joe story and multiply it by thousands and you get the story of economic growth, okay? If you cannot, if Joe couldn't fi fund this machine, then no economic growth because we cannot, we cannot find growth, okay? And that's kind of like uh, uh, the main argument for why banks are so important. So what's the problem, right? So we have an important business that is really important when it doesn't work, uh, 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 people uh, uh, jump from roofs and they provide really, banks provide really important service. So what's the problem? Why I'm talking about evolution and revolution and all of that. So there are a few reasons, but the first one is people hate banks. You know, you can turn it any way you want, but people really hate banks. And, you know, when they asked uh, American millennials, 71% uh, of American millennials prefer to go to the dentist rather than to go to their, uh, to their bank branch. To the dentist, I had dentists, sorry. <laughs> you know, or any dentist who, had, who is on, on this call. And uh, very few believe that banks will make good on their promises. Uh, so banks are, are, are essentially hated. 
The second issue is, and it's probably in the core of, of, of the problem, is that there is uh, research that shows that the banking services are very expensive. It's not that they're expensive to use, we know that, but they're very expensive. The unit cost of banking service of every dollar intermediate, the intermediated is very expensive. So the uh, estimate from the United States and from Europe, and there is no reason to think it will be different in Israel or in Australia, is around 2%. So for every dollar that banks take as a deposit and, 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 and lend, it costs 2%, it's huge. Think about your interest rate on your mortgage, 2% out of that is essentially cost, cost in, in the system. So what is this 2%? Mainly employees, so human capital, but also computing, IT. Okay, so those are the main costs, but 2% is a lot of money. Okay, think about all the assets that are being held in the banking system. So banks are hated, banks are expensive, the third problem is that banks are systematically risky. What does it mean? Banks are all interconnected together. This bank has loans in this bank and deposits in this banks. And, and, and if banks, if a large enough bank falls, we have a risk of contagion between all banks, not only in this, in this specific country, but all across the world. And regulators understand that banks are risky. And, uh, banks understand that regulators understand that they're risky, but because banks understand that regulators understand that they're risky, it's, it's kind of, I feel like Donald Rumsfeld for a second here, but because uh, uh, banks understand that regulators understand they're risky, they're allowing themselves to take just a bit more risk because they know that the regulators, there, there is very limited ability of the regulators to punish them for what they do. And it goes in circles. Okay, so there is recent regulation in the last 10 years of too big to fail, but essentially, you know, banks are risky for the economy. They are very good when they work, they're extremely important, but banks are systematically risky for the economy. And the fourth problem is it's a trillion dollars industry. It's huge. Banking industry is the largest industry in the world by far. There is nothing that gets even close to it. Okay. So what happens when we have an industry that one, people hate, two, it's expensive, three, systematically regulators hate that it's systematically dangerous, and fourth, it's worth trillions of dollars, you start getting disruption, okay? So you get competitors starting to get, uh, uh, to get in. And like any revolution, you know, it starts with, it starts small, but, you know, we have all these competitors that now have incentives because, the, because all of those factors that I described earlier to start eating chunks of the banking sector. And this is a very famous slide in the financial technology area. So um, I'm not sure that Wells Fargo has branches in Australia, but when I was, uh, Wells Fargo is one of the large, largest banks in, in the United States. Uh, this is, I, I'm not sure you can actually see it below all the logos here, but this is the actually home, the, this is the home page or used to be the home page of Wells Fargo. And you can see that every aspect of the bank, personal, investing, uh, uh, pension, uh, payments, money transfers for everything that this bank is doing. It used to be my bank when I was in the United States. There are dozens, I mean, here it's the, there are only top tens. There are dozens of financial technology companies that compete. Okay. And this is what we call the unbundling of the bank. And believe me, you know, I'm not sure whether it's the case in Brazil or, or, or Australia. But I can tell you that in Israel, my bank, the bank that I'm sitting on its board, still asks for uh, certain documents in a fax machine, right? I can promise you that none of those fintechs will ask you to send a fax to, uh, to provide their service. So what they're saying is we'll provide you a, more, a better service, better UX, better user experience, uh, and we'll treat you better. You can trust us. We're good. 
right? So that's kind of like the idea behind uh, uh, behind this uh, financial technology uh, financial technology co uh, companies. You know, and uh, just because I want to be proud, um, this is the map, the same thing, but this is the map of the Israeli fintech. And Israel is one of the leading countries when it comes to financial technology. So I wouldn't, I just mention a few names because all of those, this, sorry, this slide is just a bit old. It's from 2000, 2020, so it's around one year old, but Pioneer just went for, uh, uh, just, respect, but it's traded now for a few, few uh, billion dollars in, uh, in NASDAQ. Uh, and eToro that you see right here, and there are dozens of companies here that are worth now more than a billion dollars. And a lot of them are should be in the exit side of here. So there is a lot of money going, going in here. And a lot of it is actually coming from Israel, a lot of this innovation. But this is a bit misleading because when you think about it, so we have a lot of companies that are doing that and, you know, they're worth billions of dollars. But if you take a step back and try to think about whether you use any of those financial technology firms to do what your banks, is doing, what your banks uh, are doing, and you'll try to think it like seriously, you will see that there is no... Uh, um, traction, at least in the general public, from most of those firms. It's still niche areas, especially in the payments. We don't see in Australia and in Israel and in the United States, I will explain that there's a bit different in other countries, we don't see a strong penetration of financial technology companies to the main, uh, 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 to the main public. And there is a reason for that. And, and the reason is probably uh, related to something that is the second asset of banks. So banks have major assets. We talked about information. They're very good at handling information. They have information. But the second biggest asset that banks have, and none of those are on their balance sheet, is trust. So when you deposit money in a bank, you can trust that you will see your money back. When you put your money through a, a bank to transfer it from one country to another, you know that it will go through. When you send your money or deposit your money in a company that's called Flint.com, hell, <laughs> I don't know if it will go through. Uh, you know, that's so, so the banking sector still enjoys one of the most important things that you can do in business, and that's the, it has our trust. We know that our, our, our money, and you know, it's a great work that central bankers have done through the years, is this sector is known for, for its trust, okay? We hate it, but we trust it. And, and so how do I see it moving forward, at least in major economies? So we saw the unbundling of the bank in, in small startups, but who, in my opinion, can start changing the picture? Uh, in my opinion, it has to come from the big, big techs. So I know Australia has a, you had a huge uh, controversy with Google lately, uh, but that's good. But you know, I'm, I'm, I will be, and uh, I will not be surprised if I find out that one of the people who, uh, or one of the industries that really wanted that is the banking industry. Uh, and the reason is the ones that can really disrupt the financial industry are the big technology. Because if I trust the big techs to provide the diapers to my son exactly at the right time, I can, I can I trust them to provide the vitamins to my wife exactly at the right day. I can probably, uh, 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 I, I, I feel relatively okay with putting money in Amazon and knowing that I will get it back. I will also feel kind of fine with sending money through Amazon, okay? And what we're starting to see is firms like Amazon, like Google, they're starting to go through, and this is another bank. This is the homepage of another bank, so another bank I work with in, in the United States. So this is Chase Manhattan. And you can see that Amazon is starting to get into everything that this bank is doing. And again, Amazon has the customers. 
Amazon has information. Amazon knows how to use this information. And Amazon has trust. So if I had to make a bet on where the revolution is coming, it will come from, I would be less worried as, as a banker from uh, the small startups. And I'll tell you more about it in, in, a, um, in, in a few minutes. I'll be more concerned about the big tech getting in. So, you know, as again, as a banker, uh, you know, I'm kind of happy they're now in Congress for using data too much. And, you know, uh, they have some uh, tax issues and their, uh, uh, their focus is somewhere else. But uh, they will not be able to ignore such a huge industry for too long. Okay? And we see evidence for that as we, uh, as, as, as we go through time. So I was skeptic so far on whether the revolution uh, will happen, what's the time frame of this financial revolution. But I want to take you to, uh, to an area that's closer to you than it's closer to me, which is China, because the revolution, the, the battlefield of the financial technology revolution actually started there. So when you see a beggar, a street beggar in China, that doesn't have to have even have bank account. What he has is, you know, QR code and everything goes directly, all the funds go directly to, to, to his phone. That's a change. And that's not the only thing. There, there, there is a reason for that and I'll explain in a second, but that's the, not the only issue. So I told you about the big tech, right? And whether they can do uh, uh, certain things. So uh, China has two big techs, Tencent and Alibaba. You've probably heard about Alibaba. You probably, I'm not sure if you heard about Tencent, but Tencent is a huge one as well. But this is a, a, a screenshot from uh, the application of Alibaba. They have uh, their uh, financial arm is called Ant Financial. And so this is the platform. So someone, and sitting in China through their phone can have all the services that they want on their phone. So they can transfer money. They can run a deposit or they can get money on their phone. They can book food. Uh, they can book a train, sorry. They can order food. Uh, they can uh, uh, order movies. They can buy insurance. Everything through this freaking app. Now, Think about it. What I told, remember what I told you about what banks should really, really be good at, right? They need to know information in order to be really good at assessing what is the chances that someone will default. Now, if you do everything for this application, they know what time I will I get up to the train, which vodka do I like? They know everything about me, everything. And for them, they know what insurances I have. For them, the jump toward giving me a loan is actually pretty straightforward, right? And all the services, again, in, uh, uh, they know when I'm buying a car, they can offer me uh, uh, either insurance or actually the loan to buy the car where I'm at a car dealer. So this is a huge development. So it's mainly in China and mainly also in India. It happens in, in third world countries, and there is a reason for that, right? So it's another thing that we know from research. Um, first, we know that in, this, in those areas of the world, uh, there was a relatively large population of underserved uh, and sometimes unserved uh, individuals that were essentially unbanked. So no one, this guy probably couldn't open a bank account. Right, and now we can do everything for his phone, and uh, uh, there is um, the the research that I'm talking about is actually something pretty interesting. I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but the evidence for that are pretty clear through the through the literature. So here is the idea. Um, remember when I told you that banks are really important for economic growth. And remember, I told you the story about Joe that uh, uh, needs a loan to, to buy this machine. So when Joe will buy this machine, he will start compete against incumbents that are in this country. 
So the, now there are interest groups who don't want financial development because the financial development actually helps competitors to start working against them. Okay, this is a very famous story by and a very famous paper by Rajan and Zingalas. And uh, it's extremely interesting theory, but again, the evidence for that are pretty clear. So this is why uh, uh, we see that in certain countries, the banking sector is, uh, uh, is behind. And you know, there are interest groups that have strong interests for why banking, the banking sector shouldn't develop. But now everyone has phones and there is a limit to how much you can control this, okay? So this is why the first battlefield of the financial revolution actually comes from countries that people are unserved or underserved. And, uh, and by the way, privacy laws, obviously in data collection laws are relatively, laws are relatively weak, okay? Because you know, if you had privacy laws in here, some of that would, uh, uh, would be probably impossible. So let's talk about just the technology that enables all of that. Uh, let me just look at time. Oh, still have, uh, I don't have a lot of time as I can see. So uh, the first logo that we have here on the top left is e-commerce. E-commerce enabled uh, uh, some of the revolutions that we see in financial technology. I think 15 years ago, would you have put your credit card in, uh, uh, in the internet to buy something from China? That just, you know, just thinking about it, you know, make it your mind blow, right? This is like, I'll put my car in the internet, yeah, and something will happen. This is, uh, uh, this is nuts. But now everyone buys from Amazon. It looks, uh, uh, it looks pretty, uh, uh, you know, pretty convenient, and we don't understand how we didn't do it in the past. The second thing is uh, uh, cell phones. It's not only, you know, obviously smartphones, we do everything for our smartphones. Now it collects data on us and, and, and this data enables a lot of things. And we, we have the phone available to us at any, at any minute, right? So again, think about the example of you go to buy a new car, you sit at the dealer and through, uh, through the table there, you can buy insurance, you can take a loan, you can do everything for your cell phone, right? This is just amazing. Uh, it's more banking as a service and insurance as a service. The, the first thing that happened is a strong improvement in biometrics. So think about your face, that, that, uh, that your phone reads uh, your face and you can identify yourself or your fingertip. That's a huge change. Uh, another point, uh, another thing that happens and it has strong, uh, strong impact on the banking sector are cyber and uh, fraud technologies. Uh, there was a strong improvement in our ability to identify uh, frauds on, uh, on the way in any e-commerce or banking transaction, but also to protect the banks that are using online services. Uh, now I'm moving to the thing that looks like a lock. So that's a symbol for open API. Uh, remember what I told you about banks, that their main, one of their assets that doesn't sit on their balance sheet is information. Open API, to those of you who don't know what it is, essentially means that all the information the bank has on you belongs to you, the customer. So now banks in many countries, it started in Israel, in the United States, it's there for a while. And banks will have to provide the data on your account to everyone that wants to use it because it's your data, it's the customer data. And that completely changed things in many, in, in many countries. And we also know, finally, we know what to do with data. Think about all the transactions that you ever had, multiply it by billions as the human population, and how to even deal with that. So now big data techniques, artificial intelligence allows us to do that in a very clever way. Uh, so that technology completely changed things. And uh, this B there, with like a lot of computers connected together, is blockchain technology that I will try not to get to. But the idea is that you have you know what, I'll tell, uh, because it's, a, it's a, such a cool technology and people don't understand it enough. I personally understand the technology, but don't, un don't understand what to do with it. That's a completely different story. But uh, uh, blockchain technology essentially allows you to overcome one of the most important problems in, in, uh, that we have. So think about, uh, it's, it's 
electronic ledger. Think about it as an electronic ledger or electronic database. But what it allows you, the problem it allows you to, to solve is it allows you to solve a lot of problems, but the major one is called the double spending problem. How do you know when I give money to Marcelo or tell Marcelo I'll send you money, how does Marcelo know that I have the money, right? The solution today is you go to a bank and a bank solves this problem. You have a trust agent in between. What the blockchain allows you to do is allow you to have a trustless system where the blockchain itself, the technology, the underlying technology, uh, uh, gives you enough verification for the fact that this guy has, or I have the money to actually transfer to Marcelo. Okay, so that solves a lot of problems. And the last thing that happened, it really changed a lot of things. And again, this is, uh, 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 you know, we like to hate central bankers and the regulators, but one of the things that they did amazingly in the last 10 years is develop regulation around that and regulation that enables this technology to come through. And that's not, those are risky technologies. Uh, the fact that regulators were willing to take the risk, it's something for them. And, you know, it's their ass on the line, essentially. And it's not easy to make those decisions when, uh, when you need to make those decisions. I won't get into essentially what, those techn what this technology enables us to do, but, you know, in, in big terms, it allows us to cut the middleman, give the customer a better experience. I talked about information, how we can use this technology to get better information and obviously improve the operational efficiency of, uh, uh, of banks. So some, uh, I'll close with a few remarks about research and then I'll stop. Uh, so what do we know about, from research about this all, all thing? Uh, so first we know that algorithms can do better job. Uh, well, we're not there yet, right? But many times they can do a better job in predicting this probability of default and loss given default that I was telling you about earlier. Uh, humans have no, many biases, right? So let me give you an example that, that, uh, that was in research and how computers solved that pretty easily. So for example, there is a known bias that men tend to lend more to men and they tend to lend less, men loan officers tend to lend more to men and they tend to lend less to women and men default more. So it's obviously, it obviously doesn't really make sense. Uh, and you know, the computers are actually doing a better job at this because they're enable us to, to, remove, to remove this bias. We also, as investors, we like to use, or individual investors, we like to use sexy stocks, buy sexy stocks. And, and we have certain biases in the way we invest. This is why 80% of, uh, of trade in the United States right now is being done by robots, right? So that's, that's a huge number, right? Um, when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer lending, so co when computers are involved, um, the fintechs definitely show less biases. They show that they entered, uh, those fintechs are entering areas where uh, minorities are, uh, or they lend more to minorities than, uh, than uh, major banks. Uh, nevertheless, there are still evidence, strong evidence, that even algorithms are biased against minorities and against women. You, you'll be shocked, right? That you have a robot, essentially a computer program, that still is still biased against uh, minorities. That's kind of nuts, but, but the evidence is pretty strong. Uh, we do see that uh, algorithms are doing a better job at lending in times of crisis, which is the, exactly what we want them to do. Um, but thinking about that, it's still, you know, all this research is still uh, really early. And now let me conclude by telling you, remember uh, my first question or whether banks are more like cockroaches or, uh, or whether they are more like bees? Banks are definitely cockroaches. They've been with us since forever, and they're going to stay with us forever. What do we know from research that, that provides me this evidence is the, the biggest investors in financial technology companies, the biggest investors are banks. Banks improve their services all the time as a response to the competition. We actually, what we've seen the last few years that the unit cost that I told you about is 2%, that is cost, cost a bank to deliver a $1 of intermediated asset. It's going down significantly in, the re in recent years since the fintechs have started. 
So banks are and bankers are extremely clever people, and they respond to the competition in a very unique way, in a clever way. So again, as a banker, I may be biased, but I, I do believe that bankers provide a service that uh, uh, financial technology companies cannot and will not be able anytime in the near future to, uh, to imitate. Uh, so thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Dan, that was uh, very, very nice, wonderful. And uh, you, of course, uh, a professor, because your ability to be very, very didactic, easy to understand. And, and you know, one of my uh, lemmas is that uh, whenever you know a subject very well, you can do it and you can explain it very easily. And I think we had just this, uh, 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 this example just right uh, right here. Uh, my role here is to is to moderate, to ask a question, I have my own question, but we do have two questions here in the in the Q and A. Um, but let me start telling you uh, uh, just a small story, very short. When I was appointed governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, we had this issue that you uh, that you pointed out. That in one hand. You want to be able to provide credibility to the banking system because you mentioned they, they, they are credible, but of course the banks are only credible if you, they are well supervised, if they don't fail, if you don't get a crisis like in 2008, the great financial crisis. Uh, so there's regulations, you ask them to put some capital aside, which is money in case uh, something bad happens and they don't have to resort to the taxpayer. Uh, you, you, you enter into the bank and you ask them how are they doing, how is their processes. So this is one side, but the other side is what you just mentioned, which is newcomers, uh, the fintechs, which are basically financial uh, companies based on technology and they do it very well. Uh, they cut costs, they sometimes do it better. Maybe they have less biases, as you mentioned. So when you are a governor, you have these two sides. On the one side, there are the banks uh, that you don't want to, to, to destroy in the sense that you don't want to take the credibility. But on the other hand, uh, you do want the technology and the newcomers to reduce costs, to provide better uh, consumer experience. So this balance is a relatively complicated balance. And the way I dealt with it was, well, uh, let, the, let the fintechs grow. I just didn't want, I just didn't, I wasn't in their way. And at the end, after my term, they, they decided I was almost like a hero because <laughs> a lot of technology, they all there. And, uh, but uh, what I basically, what I did was basically just not be in the way allow them to flourish, we call it the sandbox, we, we allow it and what the result is that we're seeing a lower cost, the spreads that you mentioned, the difference between what they pay on the deposit, how the land have been going down. People are happy with their payments when they send money from Brazil to, I don't know, the US or to Israel, it's becoming less expensive. Although this is one of the places where uh, we still have globally an issue uh, of reducing the cost of international payments. So uh, that uh, your, your presentation just reminded me of this very nice experience I had. So let's go to the, to the questions. Uh, let me start with one question I have, which is basically allowing you to elaborate a little bit more on, on the banks. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, are the banks going to be bees or cockroaches? And I want to ask you uh, to answer to us, basically, what do you think? It's a bit of futurology. It's an educated guess. But you have on one side the banks, on the other side the techs. Are they going to survive? How do you see this? Are the banks going to be there? Uh, we know things are changing. For example, money is much more digital. We have the, even, even, even we have like this uh, crypto money. And we also know that retail banks are changing. 
uh, they're closing branches because they're getting digital. So the digitalization is getting into the banks. So let me ask you, how do you see banks in the future? How do you see fintechs changing banks? Can they live together? So just uh, answer this question, then I'm gonna get into the Q&A of the questions we, we have here. Yeah, and that's obviously, as you know, that's a, that's a million dollar question, or that's the trillion dollar question. And uh, I, by that's the way, why I'm asking, and you, yeah, I, 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 you're yeah. answering. <laughs> uh, uh, by the way, I was very serious. I think that uh, before before I answered, I, was, I, I think that central bankers, uh, the modern central bankers, uh, did an amazing job in allowing those fintechs uh, to develop. And, uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, that that you know. Uh, is, is, is really important to say, because that's, a, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a tough job. And so I, I uh, as I concluded my, uh, my talk, I think that banks are going to, to stay with us forever, but they're going to look very different. They look very different because, uh, you know, if I'm, a, I'm an old style banker, right? So I look at information I look at, uh, you know, collateral. I look at uh, what the business is telling me they want to do, and I make a decision on whether to lend or not to lend. I think this is going to be completely different 10 years from now. And we know, we already see uh, uh, firms, for example, Pagaya, for example, it's an Israeli fintech that actually goes to the credit applications of individuals and businesses using AI, uh, artificial intelligence technologies and big data technologies. And, and using this data, they make the credit decision for the banks. So what I'm trying to say is that I think the modern bankers are, are going to look very different from you and me on. Uh, you know, we're, uh, uh, we're not going to be the same. You know, look 10, 20 years from now, I think the guy that will speak and have this conversation is going to be the technology guy. Yes, they will understand finance, but they will be tech uh, people. Uh, you know, the namesake of my, my chair uh, used to be someone that really believed in people. And, and this touch, Elon, that you and I are, you know, really important for us to understand the business, really important for us to understand the person that asks for a loan from us, it's going to be com completely different. And again, I think that banks, modern banks, or it's not modern, we're not there yet, we're not going to be there in, in the next 20 years. But in 20 years, the banks are going to be technology companies. And we already know that most of the employees in banks right now are technology, or <laughs> technologists, right? Not bankers. And the, the, the scale is going to continue to shift towards that way. I don't know if it answered your question, but that's kind of no. Weird. That's uh, that's that's clearly going to be. I mean, we are, we when you look at banks today, the amount of money they spend uh, on investment and R and D on technology is huge. And one of the major problems is what I call the legacy problems because the technology. Uh, sometimes was done 10 years ago, the systems are old and they have to compete with these young companies with uh, at the cutting edge of the technology and they cannot respond as fast as the new guys. So yes, right. I think- So fix the problem of a CEO, your CEO, for example, what, you know the amount of risk that that is in changing a core system. Yeah. Right? The riskiest thing you can do, change a core system, the core computer system in the bank, no one is willing to do that, essentially. <laughs> this is just too risky. And without changing the core system, you will never be able to compete in that level with those fintechs. You know, you have to use yeah. other assets. And for me, this is the value of the fintechs because since they, 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 they don't have legacies, they don't fear destroying the core, they can be... Uh, free to invest in new technology and to have what we call creative destruction. You destroy the, the core and you create something new. But let me get here to the questions from for the audience uh, because we could then we could talk for 
more, one hour more of that. So <laughs> I just put people here. And we just had the first question from Ross, uh, where he's, uh, he's uh, complaining on, on a bank, which basically refused uh, to accept, uh, accept him because he, he, without answering some very invasive questionnaire about supervision. Not only his, his information about himself, but information about his tenants, about his clients. And he basically refused and uh, he asked, uh, why did they need to do that? Uh, 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 is this a trend uh, of this requirement? Uh, this is what we call the issue of trust. I figure that uh, you have to ask. Uh, so Dan, why, why banks are so invasive? Why do they trust so much? I actually question? think that you, you're better able to answer this question than I do, but... Um, I think uh, it, it, it's a trend. It's the last 10 years trend. And the idea is the main idea. Think about it like that, right? The compliance is a huge thing in banking. And, uh, but I think what happened in the last 10 years is that lawmakers and regulators understood something that is really important to them, is that banks can do a better job in making sure that clients will comply with the law than regulators can. So essentially they made banks as gatekeepers to many of the processes that you see. So things like money laundering, terror financing, uh, tax evasion, all of those you have banks in the central and under current laws and regulation, again, it's a trend in the last 10 years, under current laws and regulation, they essentially have a lot of responsibility to make sure that an individual or business don't do any of those bad things. If you ask me, it's really bad for the banks, but it's really good for, for society because really banks have all this information and they can do a lot of things that the government having has more trouble of doing. So don't, don't take it personally. It's there and it's going to stay. I, you know, when I came back from the United States to Israel, essentially the only thing they didn't ask me is what, what, what's the size of my underwear? Because they asked me, they asked me about everything that uh, that's there. Right? So, uh. so, so I think that's that's exactly it. I mean, regulators are basically demanded banks. Uh, if anything happened, uh, if for example you transfer uh, some money and this comes from illegal activities, you really charge the banks. They are responsible. So somehow we do, we're not giving them a lot of uh, uh, space to, to not answer and they were very afraid. So basically they ask uh, too many questions because they don't want to be responsible for any corruption, uh, tax evasion, um, uh, criminal activities, other criminal activities. So they're basically very, very fearful and that's why they react in this way. We need to find a balance of how how this does not affect the, the quality of services to the consumers. So we have another question here uh, on, uh, let me, there, I think we have more questions that, um, of time because I just got a, a yellow card and you know, yellow card in football is, uh, is that uh, oh, I'm gonna get a red card and we're gonna all be expelled. So let me, let me, let me see what are the questions I can filter here. So. Uh, it's that's a, Roger asks a very interesting question. Is this a time to start selling down on a bank shares in a portfolio? So, <laughs> what do you do with your portfolio? You, you you think banks are still gonna be there, or or, or if they're gonna be there, the value gonna diminish? Are you gonna sell or are you, are you buying the bank? You should, you should probably, Roger should probably ask your robot because it just says, as I told him. Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to take the risk. I will take the risk of answering that. I think, again, as I mentioned, I think banks, you should go long on banks. Uh, I, I don't think this industry is going anywhere. Uh, are too many clever people who work in this industry and they will be just become a technology company. So look at the multiples or on the multipliers of a technology company. Now apply those to a bank and you can see what, what I think uh, should be the worth of banks. So I would go, I, I sorry, I'm, I don't want to give advice. I will tell you what I am. I am long on banks. 
Okay, so I, I invest in banks. Very good. Uh, uh, let's be, let me get uh, uh, one more question. Uh, uh, David asks, uh, what do you think that the value of the credit bureau will be reduced due to A, open banking and B, big tech data? So let me just, before I pass to you, explain what is an open banking, which is basically uh, uh, regulators forcing that this information, the value you, you, you told us, that banks have two values, uh, the information they have and the credibility. So on one of them, regulators are basically forcing that information be transferred easily from one bank to the other. And the reason they do it is that the consumer be the owner of their own information so that they can use their information to get a cheaper loan Somewhere, somewhere else. And big tech, you know, it's big tech. So big tech data is all these big companies. You mentioned Amazon. And I know that banks really fear the big tech much more than the fintech. So for you, Dan. So I, uh, the only thing I speak about is evidence. So open banking in the United States is there for, for many years. Uh, so that's the biggest experiment that I'm aware of. And we haven't seen um, devaluation in the services of banks. The big question is whether, uh, the, the big text is a much bigger question. And uh, th this one is just too close to call. And now the big techs have so many problems with regulators, people are calling to break those up. Uh, so I think they also, big techs are worried about getting into this, into those services. Uh, so I think it will take time, at least in the larger countries, uh, for big techs to get into, like seriously into financial services. And, and we'll just, you know, it's a drama. Like, you know, the drama is much bigger than I imagined, right? Because the drama happens in a different area, in the, in the area of regulation of information and the regulation of uh, competition and uh, the FTC, but really, you know, a lot of the future of banking depends on this drama rather than drama that's actually happening in the financial sector. Okay, I think we got to the last uh, question. Uh, Ross Kuschitsky, he basically uh, draws on an ability in Australia to have what, uh, what usually are payroll loans. You get on their wages, you can anticipate to pay your bills, and other issues so that the guarantee is basically the wages. And the advantage is that you pay bills, food, mortgage, anything on that. And for some reason, it's uh, Ross believed that this is not working properly. Uh, so do you want to discuss a little bit on this, uh, on this type of loans and uh, what, wow. what, are, what are the advantages and costs? that's extremely political, politically complicated situation. So the evidence we have around the world or, you know, they, they come mainly from the United States where this is allowed, is that uh, lenders, not banks, usually those are non-bank lenders, they take advantage of people who actually need those loans. And the haircut that a lender uh, will take for those payday loans is huge. And, you know, what happens is that, you know, after 10 or 15 of those rounds, essentially you won't have money because of those haircuts. Uh, I, it can work better, but the incentives there, because you know the customer who's paid their loans is, is pretty desperate. And uh, the incentives there are pretty, you know, bankers, banks usually, you know, the big banks usually don't want to deal with those type of loans. And the people who want to deal with those type of loans, the pay their loans are the people who you probably shouldn't, uh, who probably shouldn't <laughs> uh, lend. Because, and again, this is extremely, in here I would say, you know, it's a political situation. I, uh, I, I would be careful in allowing that. Uh, but Elon, you you've been you've probably been in the same pressure about people letting <laughs> you uh, you know asking you to allow that or disallow that. We no, we we, we are, Dan, 
We basically allowed it here in Brazil. It was quite successful so far. So we basically took the risk, but it's not an easy call. I can I can tell you, but it has been, it has worked quite quite good because in Brazil the difficulties are getting uh, guarantees. So if you have a wage, you know you can uh, you can use this money to pay for the loans. Uh, just before we close, David, correct here uh, the question we we post on on open banking and big tech, and he says I I, I really want to know. What will happen with the value of credit bureau data once we get open banking? So, so, so actually, to... I think it will become less valuable because the data is there. Any any company can do their own credit analysis. Uh, still, credit bureau has some advantages, but but generally speaking, uh, with open banking, you know, in the United States, those coexist: uh, open banking and credit bureaus. Uh, but as tech evolves, uh, people put less weight on, uh, on the credit bureaus. Uh, so that's what we know from actually what happens in reality. So we still have credit bureaus in the United States, but they're, they're, but the weight that lenders are putting on, on this information is lower than it used to be before, uh, before, uh, uh, before it started, the open banking started. Very good. I think we answered the most of the questions. We are over time. And uh, the, we have the referee saying that we need to close the game. So uh, I'll pass back to Marcelo, to Alex, and just thank you very much, Dan. Thank you all for this wonderful. Thank you, uh, Elon. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, Ilan and uh, Dan. Uh, thanks so much for, for a really wonderful overview of this topic. I think my partner here, Marlene, was at the start of your talk about to sell all of her stock in the banking sector, and then she quickly bought it back <laughs> at the end of, the, of your talk. So thank you for that. Um, people might have some other questions. I, you can pass them to me. And next time I'm in Beersheba eating shawarma with Dan down the road, I will be sure to ask him your questions. Um, I'm mindful of the time and that everybody, that Dan in particular and the others in Tel Aviv might need to carry on with their day. So with that, I will, I will thank you all for, for um, coming to this evening for, for this wonderful presentation and um, have an excellent week. I also wonder how many more Australian um, gold medals Australia won while we were having this, uh, this talk. Uh, so we'll go and, and have a check and have a lovely night, a great week over in Israel, and uh, take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.